Instead of looking for what you want to get from someone, I got a big suggestion for you. Flip the script and look for what you can give someone. We are consumer people, and we tend to look at someone else for what we can get from them. But I'm going to tell you this. If you come to the table going, I want to give the very best, you're more likely to get the very best because you don't attract what you want. You, you tend to attract what you are. All right, everybody. Hey, welcome to New Life Church. I'm so glad to see you guys. Come on. This is a great day. You know why? It's Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day. Can we give it up for all the moms in the house today? Come on. I'm like, honey, what do you want to do today? And this is what she said to me. I'm not your mother. Um, and I was like, Oh, wow, that's right. Yeah, and she reminds me of that often, actually. I'm not your mother. Um, so today, I do want to say happy Mother's Day to my mom. My mom lives in Florida. She, she watches every single week, guys. My dad also said a couple months ago when I was there, he goes, you know, I watch too. I was like, I know that. Okay, great. So I want to say hi to my mom. I want to tell her happy Mother's Day. You're the best, mom. I love you. Thank you for always being in my corner, always supporting me. Even in my worst, you still believed in, in me and you still saw the best in me. And uh, I hope that today I don't embarrass you. Love you, Mom. Okay. All right. There we go. Awesome. Awesome. Well, man, I hope you guys have uh, something special for your mom plan. Maybe your mom's with you. If she is and you're sitting next to her, it's a great opportunity to reach over, squeeze her hand, let her know that you love her. It's fantastic. We are in session three. Session three of our current teaching series, Ruth. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm speaking on Sundays, sessions one, three, and five. And then in the midweek, I'm broadcasting in a special um, you know, venue, in our podcast venue, uh, weeks two, four, and six. And so I want you to partake of that, right? Because chapter one, what we found out about, about Ruth was this. Um, Ruth is a Moabite, meaning that she is living amongst the people that don't worship the one true living God. She's got customs and things that um, are completely opposite of the Israelites. Her God, you know, promotes the sacrifice of children. The one true living God does not, right? You have Naomi and, and Elimelech, and they've got um, famine going on in Bethlehem. They decide we're going to move to Moab for a better job, and they move there with their two sons. Elimelech dies. Their two sons find these two Moabite women, and they marry them. One of them is Ruth. But then after that, the, the boys, uh, the young men, they die as well. And then it's just Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws. One of the daughter-in-laws stays in Moab. And the other one, Ruth, says, no, uh, I'm going to go wherever you go. Your God's going to be my God. And she goes back to Bethlehem um, in an act of like repentance, of turning her back on Moab, turning her back on sin, and turning her face towards where God wanted her to be. And so that's where she goes. And that's chapter one. Then in the podcast, man, you got to watch the podcast, all right? How many of you guys watched the podcast uh, this week? Anybody? Anybody? Can I hear you? Can I hear you? Okay. All right. So you guys know I gave you some sweet pickup lines. I'm talking they are good. Now, they don't work at the bar. They don't work at the YMCA. Uh, they're not going to work on the golf course. They're all going to work at places around the church. And if you use some of my pickup lines and they don't work, don't blame it on me. All right? Maybe you needed to perfect that pickup line a bit, little bit better. Or maybe you shouldn't have used it at all. All right? Um, so anyways, but we, we started into Ruth chapter 2. And we were really looking at, like, how do I find true love? I mean, people are looking for love. They, they want to find true love. And we looked at these two characters, Boaz, right, who is the owner of the land, and then Ruth, this foreigner now who lives in Israel, in Bethlehem. And um, we look at these two characters and we discover some qualities about their lives that help you to truly find what real love is. And so you're going to want to watch that podcast, okay? Now, if you miss that podcast, you can still watch it. But you gotta, what you have to do is you go to YouTube, um, look up our channel. In fact, follow us on YouTube um, at My New Life Church. If you do that, then you can get last week's um, podcast, okay? So that's how you get it. Go there. If you want to get this week's podcast, we'll send you a text message. It's super easy. Take out your cell phone and scan the QR code that's on the screen or text the word Ruth to our phone number, right? 308-303-3800. 
If you do that, then we're going to send you a text message and you're going to get the information about our midweek podcast. So take out your phone right now. New Life Church is pro phone. Okay, we're pro smartphone. We're just not pro smartphone ringer. Okay, so make sure that's off. But take your cell phone and snap a picture of that and get yourself signed up. I'm telling you, I'm going to give you more cool stuff. It may not be sweet pickup lines, but it's going to be something else, I guarantee you, and you're going to want to see it. So uh, leave that up for a little bit. But um, we're going we're gonna to jump in now to the second half of chapter two, picking up where we left off in the podcast, talking about, um, you know, how do I find true love? And what does it look like to find the right person? Everybody's looking for the right person in life. They're looking for that person that they can date, that person that can, that dating relationship might turn into a marriage. Um, and if you're married in this room, you do realize, right, that the person that you were, that you were when you were dating and that your wife or your husband fell in love with is still the person they want you to be, right? You got to still keep working on you to be the very best you God made you to be, all right? So we're looking at this, and we tend to look at the wrong things first. Like, we tend to look at, is she cute? Is he handsome? Right? You see what I mean? Like, we look at those things first. We look at, are they funny or are they smart? Which, I don't know. Like, can't they be both? My wife got both. I mean, why can't, why, <laughs> why, why can't it be both? All right? Be funny or smart. We look at those things first. We tend to look at, do they have a solid job? Can they provide for me? Do they come from a good family, right? Do they have a vision for their life? Do they know, like, where they're going? Are they kind? You also look at other things that are superficial, like, do they like coffee? Which I think is kind of important, right? Um, do they like to shower and brush their teeth? I think that's important, right? We tend to look at these kinds of things first, though, and, and here's the problem. You could find a person that meets every single one of your check boxes. All right, they're cute, they're smart, they're funny, they got a good education, they know where they're going in life, they like coffee, they're kind, they're compassionate, and they even like the shower. You could find all of that and still find the wrong person. Why? Because we're looking at the wrong things first. I got a big suggestion for you. Flip the script and look for what you can give someone. We are consumer people, and we look at relationships from a consumerism perspective as well. And we tend to look at someone else for what we can get from them. But I'm gonna tell you this, in all of life, if you come to the table going, I wanna give the very best, you're more likely to get the very best because you don't attract what you want. You, you tend to attract what you are. What you are is what you attract. It, it tends to be like a magnet, you know? Like if you're a jerk, you tend to attract jerks. If you're kind, you tend to attract kind people around you. If you're generous, generous people like to hang out with generous people. Compassionate people like to hang out with compassionate people. People that are striving after education tend to hang out with people that are striving after education. Like you, you tend to attract you know, what you are. So bring to the table the very best you that you can be. And so therefore, that's why I wanna help you now in the second half of the second chapter of Ruth. And I wanna focus in on four things. Four things that are gonna help you know, check this out, in a relationship, okay? I'm gonna use a word. Um, they're gonna help you know if you're a keeper. You wanna know if you're a keeper. Like, you're like, well, I'm already married. Yeah, but do you wanna stay married? I hope the answer is yes, <laughs> right? What, if the, what about you're single and you're looking for the right person? How do you know if you found a keeper? Okay, I wanna help you with that. In, in the second half of the second chapter of Ruth. So here's how we're gonna pick it up. We're gonna pick it up with Ruth, all right? Here's, here's the deal. Ruth is now working in this field she doesn't own the field, she's not an employee. Based on ancient law, she's a foreigner, and she gets to go to the field and she gets to pick up grain behind the workers. <clears throat> so as the workers are picking up grain and they miss things, she can reach down and pick it up, and it's technically hers. And she can take enough for what she needs for the day. That was the ancient law. So here she is, and she's working, and she's picking up this grain, she's trying to pick up enough for her and for Naomi her mother-in-law, who is a widow, who is at home because she's older. 
Ruth is younger. Ruth is like, I'm going to go out. I'm going to help us out. I'm going to make sure we survive. So she gets out there, and she's picking it up. Now, the foreman of the job site says, that's cool. You can stay here, and you're a hard worker, by the way. That's awesome. Um, then, the, then the owner, Boaz, comes along, okay, and he sees her out there, and he asks the foreman, who is that? And the foreman goes, oh, that's Ruth. She's the Moabite. She's been out here picking up grain. By the way, she's a hard worker. And she hasn't even taken but only one break. And he's like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. And so he goes over and he meets her. And, he, and he's very kind to her. And he says to her, like, hey, I know that you're a hard worker. Like, you can stay here. You can pick up all the grain you want. And even, like, if you're thirsty, you can drink from our water. Okay? So he's very kind to her. And here's how we find Ruth in in chapter 2, verse 10, it says that Ruth fell at Boaz's feet and thanked him, war- him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I'm only a foreigner. I'm only a foreigner. What have I done to deserve this kindness? Have you guys ever been in a situation where a stranger actually helped you? Have you ever been broken down on the side of the road and a stranger came along and helped you? N- maybe not recently, right, because our culture has changed. But I want you to go back a number of years. And you remember when you were in need and a stranger actually helped? How did that feel? Didn't you feel like that? Like, why, why are you doing this for me? Like, you don't even know me. Have you ever gone out of your way to help a stranger? You ever gone out of your way, you stopped, you saw someone broken down on the side of the road, and you stopped to try to help them? If you ever did, how did that person feel, and how did you feel? You ever been, like, at a gas station, and someone's trying to pay for their gas, and they're swiping the card, and they're swiping the card, and it keeps coming back, decline, 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 decline. And you're like, hey, don't worry about it. Like, I got it. And you step up there with your credit card, and you're like, here you go, and you swipe it. And the person's like, you didn't have to do that. And you're like, yeah, I know, that's right. I didn't have to. I wanted to do it. Like, doesn't it feel good when, when you're with a complete stranger, and a stranger does something, you know, like that? Doesn't it feel good when you're doing that to someone else? I mean, come on. You guys are looking at me like I don't even know what I'm talking about. You're like, stranger danger. Stay away from them. Like, don't go near them. Can I just say that's part of the problem of our culture? And can I just ask you as new lifers to go out of your way and to break that mold? Go out of your way. Go out of your way. Be be like the Boaz that goes out of his way to show kindness to what she thought was a stranger. But surprise, alert, Like, Boaz knows more about Ruth than Ruth realizes. Boaz has been at the coffee shop. Boaz has been hearing the stories about Ruth. People have been telling Boaz, like, have you seen Ruth around town? I mean, she is smoking hot. (laughs) Have you seen her? Do you know the story? You know that, you know her husband died. You know that, Boaz, right? Like, he hears all the chatter. You know the gossip that happens at the coffee shop? Come on, somebody. You guys, you guys know you're listening to other people's conversations. I was just at the coffee shop yesterday morning. I was watching everyone else listen to me. So I just decided I'll just speak louder so they can all hear me easier. <clears throat> and you just start saying crazy stuff until they get up and walk away. Ah, that's fun. That's always a good time. All right, that's just what I do. Okay, all right. So Boaz is hearing all this. Boaz is going on Facebook. Boaz is stalking Ruth. Boaz is checking out her Instagram Y'all, I mean, that's what, he's, that's what he's doing. He's out there and he's like, whoa, man, look at these pigs. Whoa, man, it's okay. And so Boaz shows up and he goes, is that Ruth? His foreman goes, that's Ruth. Oh, okay, all right. So here she is knelt down before him and this is what Boaz says. I, I know, I know that you're a foreigner. But I also know about everything that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. Why? Because I've been to the coffee shop. <clears throat> I've heard how you left your father and your mother in your own land to live here among, you know, these complete strangers. And then he prays for her. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. Guys, we don't know. The Bible actually doesn't tell us. Is Ruth physically attractive? Nobody knows. But what we do know is what her heart is, and her heart is really attractive. Why? Because Boaz now is telling us about her convictions and her godly character. You want to know if you're a keeper? You want to know if you found a keeper? Find someone who leads with godly convictions and character. Find someone who leads that way. I'm not talking about a person who sets it on the burner, lives one life, 
you know, for the whole week and then brings up the God element. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a person that, you know, strives to be a, a person that honors God on Monday, on Wednesday, on Friday, and on Sunday. Like, that's what you're looking for. And Boaz says this, I know everything you've done for your mother-in-law. What's he saying? I see your loyalty. I see your dedication, right? I see your devotion to her. He went on to say, like, I even know, I even know how you've lived your life since the death of your husband. Why would that even be important? Because back in that day, man, if you were a widow and, and, and you got widowed in Moab for sure, man, you would have you turned to prostitution. You would have turned to begging, but she doesn't turn to those things. She turns to hard work. She's out in the field. The foreman says, this is a hard worker, man. She's worked all day. And then Boaz, Boaz even says, you know, he, he goes on, he says, to her, look, I, I've heard how you left your father and your mother, how you left your own country, how you left your people, meaning this, I know that you turned your back on Moab. I know you turned your back on sin. I know you turned your back on godlessness and you turned your face towards the one true living God and you moved towards him. I know your heart is godly. I know your convictions are godly. That's how you know if you have a keeper. But then Boaz goes on and he adds to what does a godly conviction and character look like? And he starts to pray for her. And I read you the prayer. But what is that really telling us? It's telling us this. Here's what godly character does. Godly character recognizes that you belong to God first, not me. Guys, let me just tell you something. You want to find the right person in life? You want to know if you got a keeper? Find someone who's willing to honor God more than they want to honor you. Because you find somebody who wants to honor God first, you're going to get the best. You find someone that's desperate to get you, and you're going to get the worst. You find someone's desperate to honor God first, you're going to get the best. So you want to find a keeper? Find someone with godly conviction and character, right? Who knows that you belong to God first. Hold out for that. Come on, somebody. Come on, man. That's good. That's good. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to amen myself up here. I don't, I don't honestly care what you guys say. I, that was good. <clears throat> that was good. I'm just thankful no one's snoring. Thank you. Here's what Ruth said, right? Ruth responds back in verse 13. She goes, I, I hope to continue. Remember, she's bowed down before Boaz. I hope to continue to please you, sir, she replied. You have comforted me by speaking so kindly to me, even though I'm not one of your workers. Boaz used words to build her up and encourage her. Can I just tell you the second thing you're looking for to see if you're a keeper or if you found one? A person that uses words consistently to build up and encourage. You want, to know the, you want to know one of the number one things my wife wants more from me? She wants me to come home and she wants me to share more words with her. She doesn't want to ask me like, how was your day? She doesn't want to hear this. Good. But what does Jeff Baker do? I come home, how was your day? How was that meeting? How did things go? Oh, they went pretty good. See, I know, I gotta give a little extra. But that's not enough. She wants more. True intimacy with my wife is built off of communication. We think intimacy is built off of something else. I'm gonna tell you right now, true intimacy is built off of communication. When you open up your heart and you start exposing what's really going on in here and what's really going on up here. And when you start sharing more and more and more of that, man, you're finding a keeper. In fact, when you find someone who speaks words that are life-giving, you're finding a keeper as well. Not just someone who talks, okay? There's a lot of talkers. I'm talking about people that speak words that build up and they encourage. Ruth said, Ruth said to Boaz, look, here's, here's what I know about you, Boaz. You've comforted me by speaking so kindly. It means this, like you have warmed my heart. You have softened my heart. You have moved me with words. Come on, you guys have been moved by words before. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, that the tongue can bring both death or life. You've been moved by words. You, you've been moved to tears by the words of another person in a good way, not just a bad way. It happens both ways, doesn't it? Can you think of moments when someone spoke so kindly to you, they spoke so uplifting, so encouraging to you, that it just, it moved your heart? Of course you can. All of us can. And all of us have done that for someone else at one point or another. 
And here's what I love about the statement that Ruth said to Boaz. She goes, I know that you're a kind man. I know that you speak words that build up and encourage others. I've watched you do it with your employees. Watch this. Go back to verse 13. We just read it. Read it again. You have comforted me, Ruth says, by speaking so kindly to me, even though I'm not one of your workers. What does she see in Boaz? Boaz speaks kindly to his workers. Now this is a good dude. He's a keeper. That's, that's a keeper. So guys, if someone comes along in your life and they speak gushy words that seem kind and they're so you know, flowerful and they build you up, but then they turn around and they chew out the waiter and they're rude to the stranger and they're full of road rage to a person they don't even know and then they're, they speak you know, horrible language to their employees. Let me tell you something. You're next. You're next. And when a person shows you their true colors, believe it. Don't go, oh, well, that's just who they are with them. No, because eventually you will be them. Right? So you're looking, you're looking deeper than all of these things. You're looking deeper into the heart. Okay. Look, let's get on. Let's get on with the story. Verse 14 and 16. Here's what it says. At mealtime, Boaz called to her, come over here and help yourself to some food. You can dip your bread into sour wine. So she sat with the harvesters, and Boaz gave her some roasted grain to eat. She ate all that she wanted and still had some left over. When Ruth went back to work again, Boaz ordered his young men, hey, let her gather grain right among the sheaves without stopping her. Oh, and by the way, and pull out some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her. Let her pick them up and don't even give her a hard time. So guys, picture this. It's lunchtime. All of the workers now are eating together. Ruth is sitting over here by herself. And what does Boaz do? He invites Ruth, hey, come over here and hang out with us. You you know what's happening right now? You're getting a snapshot. You're sneaking in on their very first date, everybody. (laughs) You remember some of your first dates? Who, who like, was the, on the list that you were like, I don't want to see them right now? Mom, yeah. Dad, of course. Brother, sister, you better believe it. Others, yeah. Like, you just didn't want to see them. We're sneaking in. We got a little snapshot, like we're diving in, seeing the very first date. Look what, I want you to notice some things. Okay, you want to, you want to find a keeper? You want to, you're single in this room, you want to find a keeper? Find somebody who's willing to take you out on the first date that's around other people. Find someone who's willing to take you out on that first date. That's going to be a safe place. Ruth ate. This is what I love about Ruth. On the first date, on the first date, Ruth ate all that she wanted to until she was full. Ruth didn't order a side salad. Okay. I don't know about you. I never liked that. I never liked going going out on a date and I'm like, man, I'm starving. I'm going to get the big meal. I'm going to get the like, you know, three quarter pound, the, the full pound cheeseburger with fries and a milkshake and dessert. What are you, what are you just going to have? I'm, I'm just going to have a side salad. And you're like, no, you're not. No, you're not. No, that's not going to work. So I love, I love that Ruth knows how to eat. I love, that's, that's fun, man. It's fun to have a woman that knows how to eat. Come on, somebody. And so Boaz, he shares his lunch with her. He wasn't preparing to do this. This is above and beyond. You want to know that third quality of a keeper? Someone who shows care and compassion. That's what you're looking for. Husbands in the room. You know what your wife's looking for still? Do you show care and compassion? This is not just like, who are you looking for for your future? This is what you need in your marriage. Boaz went out of his way to bless Ruth. He showed compassion. He met her practical needs. Don't sit alone. Eat food. In fact, you can eat off of my plate. Honey, you can always have a bite off my dessert. A bite. Um. (laughs) But guys, (laughs) I actually love it when we go out to eat. And it gets to dessert time, because if I order dessert and Kim orders a dessert, which many times she doesn't even order dessert, but if she does, I know this, I'm getting two desserts. Because <laughs> she's going to eat a couple bites. It's going to be like the side salad moment, but it works to my favor. Honey, what dessert are you going to get? I'm getting the coconut pie. Okay, I'm going to get the chocolate, because I know I'm going to get a little bit of both. 
It's going to be amazing. So you're looking for the quality of a person who cares and is compassionate. Oftentimes, don't we find this? That early on in a relationship, a person will say anything to get what they want. They'll almost do anything to get what they want. So can I just give you some advice? Do what Ruth did. Slow down. Slow down. Don't move too fast in a relationship. Let the other person have some time to show you their true motives. I want you to notice what Ruth didn't do when she's offered to come over and eat with Boaz and have lunch with Boaz. Notice what she didn't do. She didn't immediately go, oh man, this meal was so good. Oh, Boaz, man, I, I noticed you when you first walked onto the field. I saw you when you first went out, and I thought to myself like, man, wouldn't it be good to be married to you? And you know what it would be awesome? I have five kids. I've already got the name of the first one. It's Josh if it's a boy, Joslyn if it's a girl. Like, that's moving way too fast. It's way too fast, right? She didn't do that. You know what she also, she also didn't do? She didn't go, oh, this was so good. You were so kind to me. You even shared your meal with me. Let's go make out. You find that in the movie, but that's not healthy. Right? And here's the other thing you didn't find her doing. You don't see her all of a sudden becoming like overly flirty with him. And you don't see her becoming desperate either. In fact, here's what you do see. After this moment, she continues to work in the barley field and takes up the entire barley field uh, harvest, which would have taken, you know, weeks. And then she moved on to the harvest of the wheat, which would have taken weeks. Did you realize that nothing happens between those moments? It's like the first date was awesome, it was good, but no one knew what to do. They were all awkward. Who's gonna call who? Am I gonna call them first? Am I gonna text them first? Am I gonna Instagram them? Am I gonna do that? What am I gonna do? I hit them up on Facebook. Like, what? who goes first? Everything went quiet. She doesn't become desperate. She doesn't become overly flirty. She just slows down. Because if you slow down, you get to know a person and you'll see their true heart. And here's what you find. You find Boaz being a man of his word because Boaz showed care and compassion at a whole nother level for Ruth. He goes, I'm gonna protect you. And he said to his workers, let her pick up as much grain as she wants. Oh, and by the way, don't be harsh with her. And now she gets to see, is he a man of his word over these next few weeks? And over these next few weeks, she discovers not only is he a man of his word, he's even better than that. So Boaz is a keeper because he shows care and compassion but Boaz doesn't stop there. Boaz shows us one more thing about a keeper, a person that shows generosity. I want you to go back. Go back with me in verse 15. But as we read through this, I want you to look for generosity coming from Boaz towards Ruth. This is the quality of a keeper, guys. It's one of the things, it's one of the things I don't hear couples talking about hardly at all. This is what you're looking for, someone who is generous. Okay, go back to verse 15. Look at qualities of generosity. When Ruth went back to work again, Boaz ordered his young men, let her gather grain right among the sheaves without stopping her generosity and pull out some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her generosity. Let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. Generosity. So Ruth gathered barley there all day. And when she beat out the grain that evening, it filled up an entire basket. Generosity. She carried it back into town, and she showed it to her mother-in-law, Ruth, right? Ruth also, Ruth also gave her the roasted grain. She showed it to Naomi, and she goes, hey, I got, I got some left over. Eat it as well, Naomi. Generosity at work. Boaz, generous with Ruth. Ruth, now generous with Naomi. Generosity begets generosity, Boaz says, look, Ruth, you can pick up as much grain as you want to, physically possible. Like, don't stop her, guys. In fact, give her some on the ground to pick up. And then Ruth gathers enough grain in one day that equals two weeks of a salary. I don't know about you, but I want that job. I work one day, I get two weeks of salary. That's above and beyond generosity. That's what you find from Boaz. Guys, that's what makes a keeper. Generosity is a quality of a keeper. You're, you're looking for someone that exceeds your expectations. You're looking for somebody that's generous towards God and they're generous towards others. I didn't say that they were a spender. I didn't say that they were foolish with their money. I said that they were generous, which means this. 
They recognize that everything they have first came from God. Boaz, the owner of the land, the owner of the barley, the owner of the wheat, the owner of it all. Here's what he realizes. It's not mine in the first place. It belongs to God. Even when he was praying for her, he was praying for her, recognizing she doesn't belong to me. She first belongs to God. It's a quality of a person that's a keeper that you want around you, someone who's thankful for everything God has given them and finds joy in giving it away, finds joy in sharing it with others. Not a person that's stingy, not a person that's reluctant in giving. No, you wanna find a Boaz who is a generous dude. You wanna have that person as a keeper. But watch this, the generosity level doesn't stop there. There's something about Boaz you need to know today that we find at the second half of chapter two. When Ruth comes back to Naomi and says to her, hey, you know where I've been working today? You know where I've been picking up grain for us? You know where I got this basket full of grain that's worth two weeks of, of salary? I found it at Boaz's land. Here's, here's what Ruth says in chapter two, verse 20. That man is one of our closest relatives. He's not the closest, he's one of our closest. He's one of our family redeemers. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a family redeemer? A family redeemer would be someone who steps in and rescues you in a time of tragedy. In your most difficult day, in your most challenging time, when things aren't going your way, when you've fallen flat on your face, when you've lost your husband, the family redeemer would come in and would meet your needs, even to the point of possibly even marrying the widow. Now this was the primary responsible responsibility of the closest male on the husband's side of the family. But I want you to notice something. Boaz, he isn't Elimelech's brother. He's not the brother to Naomi's dead husband. He's not the brother to Ruth's dead husband. He's not that. He, he's not the closest relative. It's not his responsibility. And Ruth, by the way, she's not an Israelite. She's a Moabite. So here's the bottom line. Boaz isn't legally obligated to do anything for Ruth, but he chooses to give her everything. And I find that amazing. He didn't have to do any of this kindness. He didn't have to show this compassion. He didn't have to be generous. He didn't have to speak words that comforted her and built her up. He didn't have to do any of that kind of stuff. He wasn't obligated to do any of those things. He didn't have to let her work on his land. He could have kicked her off. Hey, you got enough. You got enough for today now. Scoot, now get out of here. But he didn't do that. No, he gave her everything. He went above and beyond. You know what that's called? Grace. And guys, this is what Jesus did for you. Jesus protected you when you didn't deserve to be protected. He died on a cross. He gave his life for you. He met all of your needs. Jesus found you in your worst. He found you in your brokenness. He found you when, when everyone else sh was like rejecting you. He found you and he wrapped his arms around you. He goes, I don't care. I don't care what you've done. I don't care, you know, where you've been. I don't even care what you've been doing. I love you anyways. No sin is too big for the grace of Jesus Christ. No marriage is too broken for the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. And just as Boaz became the redeemer for Ruth, you have a redeemer and his name is Jesus. Jesus is your redeemer. Jesus is the one that when you don't deserve it, he came along. Even when your sin should have penalized you to hell forever, Jesus comes along and he dies on the cross for you. He loved you before you loved him. He is your redeemer. So what should your action be? Let's go all the way back to the beginning of the message. Where do we find Ruth? We found Ruth knelt down at the feet of Boaz, going, why do I deserve this kindness? I'm just a foreigner. Can I say to you today that as we move into a time of worship, that your response should be this, to kneel your heart before the Lordship of Jesus Christ and recognize you are my redeemer. You paid the price for my sin. You set me free. You chose me before I ever chose you. And God, would you do something for me? Would you instill inside of me the qualities of a keeper so that I can give the very best to the people I love the most? If you're married in this place, you wanna, you wanna add spice to your marriage? 
You want to add spice to the relationship? Come before the Lord right now and say, Jesus, would you make me the best keeper possible? And would you instill inside of me your character, your convictions, your care, your compassion, your generosity? Would you instill that inside of me so that I can give the very best? Because when you give the very best, you will get the best. So guys, let's come before the Lord and kneel our heart and say, thank you for being my redeemer. Thank you for setting me free. Why don't you stand with me? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that today is a day of liberty and freedom because you paid the price for us on the cross. You knew us before we knew you. That's just like Boaz with Ruth. You knew us. You knew our story. You knew where we've been. You know what we've been through. You know the tragedy we've walked through. You know the loss we've walked through. You know the sin of our past. You know the sin that no one else knows. You know the sin of yesterday that no one else knows. You know the struggles in our hearts. You you know the temptation that we face. You know it all. But you still love us in spite of it. And you still want to redeem us. And you still want to pull us out of that field that we're working so hard to try to make happen called life. And you want to show us purpose. Purpose that's found in you. You want to show us real life that's found in you. You want to set us free from our sin. You're asking, will we just kneel before you and recognize that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So Jesus, that's what we do. We bow our hearts before you and we say, God, thank you. Thank you that you set us free when we couldn't set ourselves free. That you paid the price for our sin when we didn't have anything to pay for our sin. Lord, thank you for that. And would you instill inside of us the qualities of a keeper so that we could give the very best to those we love the most. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.